And uh, thank everyone for joining us tonight. As Jody said, we are talking with three fiber artists this evening, namely Rosemary Bird, Chantel Cardinal, and Candace Weber. And I think we should start with some introductions. Uh, I'm Kate McDonald, and this is my 10th year as a culture crawl artist at the Hamilton Bank Building. I'm a painter and new media artist, and I also co-curate uh, moving art with the Eastside Art Society's uh, artistic and executive director, Esther Rosenberg. Now, for our three featured artists this evening, in alphabetical order, uh, we have Rosemary Bird. Rosemary is located at Parker Street Studios and has been making her streaky iPhone photos, as she calls them, for over a decade. Uh, shaking her phone with one hand while rapidly tapping the camera shutter button. Embroidery is a more recent pursuit, beginning as a fascination with running stitch and sashiko embroidery and developing over the past few years into a stitching practice that is equal parts exploration and meditation. Since she began stitching her photographs in 2021, Rosemary Artwood, Rosemary's artwork has been exhibited in Toronto, Vancouver, and throughout British Columbia. Her new series of embroidered photographs were taken in Arthur Erickson's garden, which Japanese theme inspired her to use an elongated scroll-like format for the printed photos. Next up, we're going to have Chantelle Cardinal, uh, AKA Felt à la main. Uh, who works out of the Arts Factory and produces everything from wearable art to sound absorbing wall hangings. She explores the textures and properties of wool and what it can be shaped into and, and process it herself from a raw sheep's fleece that she gets to know by name. That's pretty amazing. Uh, following a career as a fashion designer and costumer in the film industry, Chantel was introduced to wet felting techniques where she discovered the magical properties of binding fibers together. She is constantly amazed by the breathtaking ways in which wool can create a material that can be manipulated into endless possibilities of artifacts and loves to share her passion through public workshops. Uh, she recently created uh, an extra large scale window installation spanning 12 large window panels uh, and covering close to 300 square feet. Wow. I will be next year. Oh. That's a project I just got. Oh, so it's yeah. designed. <laughs> so it's in process. I got the sheep. I've got the fleece. It's, it's, it's a month long. It's, it's going to be six months of, of work uh, starting next year. That's perfect. You have your, uh, your medium and you have your, your canvas. So you're ready to go now, <laughs> essentially. Um, okay. And that takes us to Candace Weber, our third artist this evening, is the artist behind Loudly Insecure, uh, a fiber art studio located in Chinatown Score Studios. She's a multidisciplinary fiber artist and filmmaker, uh, academically trained in animation and film. She discovered a passion for making through fine art courses, artist residencies, and volunteer work in maker spaces that grew to include jewelry design, laser cutting, CNC guided embroidery, as well as traditional crafts like weaving, beading, and hand embroidery. Her distinct sensibilities as a hybrid artist allow her artistic approach to bridge the space between digital and traditional craft work. Candace was selected as a finalist in the Hand and Lock Prize in 2021, which is a competition held annually by a well-known British embroidery atelier, and only 24 finalists are selected from hundreds of applications for their prize in contemporary embroidery. An amazing accomplishment. Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> everyone, I had the absolute pleasure of seeing some of your work in person over the last couple of weeks. Rosemary, you had a piece in the presentation exhibition at George Street uh, Galleries, or sorry, Georgia Street Galleries yeah. uh, for the Take Flight exhibition. And Chantelle and Candace, 
you've both had pieces in the out of control preview exhibitions. And I have to say that seeing all of your artwork, it was really hard not to touch it. So <laughs> I, I didn't, I mean, I promise I didn't. <laughs> Rosemary, yours was framed, but I still kind of wanted to take it down and off the wall and, and turn it around and, you know, get a closer, you know, look at it. So that kind of, that's going to take me into my first question. So I'll just start alphabetically to get things rolling. Rosemary, um, you, you're a photographer. You were a photographer. So what, what was it? Was the tactile quality of fiber? Yeah. What inspired you? It's, it's kind of you to call me a photographer. Um, <laughs> really, I was the crazy person waving her phone around, um, taking photographs. And I would do the kind of things that no other photographer would do, like throw out all of the photos that were in um, that were in focus, because I just wanted the ones that had the blur and specifically a nice straight blur in them. Um, I also have no training whatsoever in photography, so I break lots of rules. I have lots of burnout in in my um, photos, which you don't know photography. It's when it gets too bright and then you lose some of your color in an area. Apparently it's a no-no, but you know, I can't help myself. Um, I also, the whole thing about moving my camera, I, like I really did think that I was just that, that crazy person who does this. Apparently you can call it intentional camera movement. So um, I'm now, no, I uh, can begin to talk about my, my photography in a slightly more sophisticated way, but still it's just, it's just me and my iPhone. But so I'd been taking these photos for over a decade. And then during the pandemic, saw a call for artists where they were wanting photographs that had been altered by hand. At that point, I had been taken up stitching as sort of my, my go-to for you know, almost like a meditative practice. And so, you know, as I sat there stitching one day, I thought, well, what if, what if I actually stitched one of my photographs? And so I did, I got, I got them printed out just about all, oh, not much bigger than they would have been on my iPhone and started stitching them. And you can see like I was using super chunky thread um, and that's sort of what they look like from the back. And again, if you're an embroiderer, you'd also know that I must be self-taught as an embroiderer because I'm really messy when I embroider, um, but that's where it goes. And so that was my, that was the beginning for me in 2021. And my first little pieces were shown in uh, Propeller Gallery in Toronto. That's a great gallery. I've actually uh, visited myself. So mm -hmm. I no, guess you probably good. didn't make it to see it, but. I did not, no. At that time, <laughs> at least. Um, Chantelle, uh, uh, and I want to just say all three of you, none of you started as fiber artists so this is why I'm kind of interested in in what got you to that place yes. so uh Chantel what was your inspiration how did you get involved in, in felting well I was always uh, dealing with material I was always sewing since I was like eight years old my mom had a sewing machine um, my mom worked in a manufacturing that brought back a lot of fabric at home um, we I started making my own clothes when I was like the minute I, she, she bought me a little sewer, singer sewing machine for kids. And basically I gave that up after a couple of weeks and just got on her very scary sewing machine. So this is at eight years old. So I've been manipulating fabric, but when I, and, and then I, I got a degree in fashion design, like, you know, that was me being an artist ish because you had to make a living. And then I accidentally fell into films. Um, that was a lot more flexible, let's say for, for, for lack of a better word to, experiment and do all kinds of st and storytelling and then when I was looking to I was always painting and doing ceramics on the side but it was always on the side and it, it never felt quite right because there's a lot of waste um, so I walked into this this workshop in on Granville Island and I knew that the space was becoming available and I asked her if she wanted to you know share the space and she said no and, but she says, she called me back a month later to say, well, I need somebody to work. And this it happened to be a felt atelier. And I knew nothing about felting, but when I realized that I can make my own fabric, mm. my mind was going to explode. 
and how how I had how had I never come across this over and you know I'm in my 40s by then it's like how did I never ever see this or come across this before so now I feel like I, I've got a lot of catching up to do because <laughs> I feel like I don't I have so many ideas that I don't have enough time to do them so I feel like I'm a little bit in a hurry but on the other hand it's such a slow meditative process um but uh it's and and so limitless so I can do three-dimensional, two-dimensional, I, I can do thin, I can do super thick. I've got a chair in my uh, studio to start a conversation to show people how robust it can be. Because most people will know felting as in, you know, a new no felted scarf or um, this, this garment that I'm wearing, for example. But uh, yeah, no, so the, the magic of binding fibers together really talked to me. And finally, I found, I felt like I found my medium. Mm. And so it's kind of like painting with fibers and it's a little bit like ceramic as you can shape things and mold things. So it, it kind of talks to a lot of different senses. And in my studio, you can touch. <laughs> and you can touch my work. <laughs> There's actually a sign that says, please do touch, because that's the only way you get to really experience the tactile nature of what we do. And yes, you could have touched my statue as well at, at the pendulum. And the galleries don't like it when I say, yeah, you can touch it. And they're like, no, I'm like, it's a tactile medium. How can you not? So, yes. So anybody, okay. if, nobody's going to yell at you if you touch the work. Good, because I'm going to go back to the pendulum gallery and I touch <laughs> the work just because you said I could. <laughs> That's awful. Um, Candace, I promise I won't touch your work without your permission. <laughs> So background in film and animation. Yes, uh, yes. What what was it about fabric that drew you in? Yeah, so yeah, I went to school for uh, digital art animation. And in my undergrad, we had done a lot of, um, like we were required to take a lot of like traditional classes. So I had really enjoyed taking, I think I took like ceramics and I did a lot of like enamel metal and metal works and things like that. But I don't think I really ever touched too much fiber art in college. It wasn't until I had, I'm originally from the US when I had moved up to Canada for a job up here in a, at an animation studio. Um, I came across, I believe uh, her name on Instagram is Ola Limon. Um, She is a embroidery artist out of, I think Argentina. I think somewhere in Latin America um, and something about it just like really resonated with me. Um, she's also a muralist and does some other things too. But I think that it may be up until that point, embroidery had only kind of been something like I grew up in the Midwest. So I think I only really ever saw like machine embroidery of like people's names on, I don't know, like on shirts or something. Mm. Uh, so it was like the first time it like clicked in my head that I could probably do this myself. Um, and I really wanted to buy one of her jackets, but like, uh, I couldn't figure out how to like buy one or request one. Cause I don't think anything was in English on the site. <laughs> so it was like, it started out as me trying to make my own jacket. Um, and then at some point I ordered a loom and then I, it just sort of like a year later I had a studio space. So I don't really know how it, uh, snowballed like that, but I feel like maybe the best way of saying it was. Yeah, I think like I, I heard hints of this, like I related to uh, what other people have said that um, something about it just like really resonated with me. And I like connected with it in a way that I don't think I've connected in other mediums, even though I've tested out a lot of different stuff. And like I would still enjoy it, like if I had the resources to do that, to continue doing other things as well. But um, something about like my brain really like connected <laughs> with it. And then it just sort of like, I really like the experimentation of it and how like mixing, cause I almost consider myself like a mixed media artist as well, mm -hmm. because I will try to incorporate like many different, it's like almost never just one thing. Um, so yeah, I, I think I like how open-ended it is uh, and how you can adjust it so much depending on what, like the, like what you want to create, so. I have so many questions. <laughs> so, so many questions. I'm, I'm going to keep you on here with me uh, for a minute, Candace, before I start looping back to everybody else. Uh, mm -hmm. just, I kind of had a little laugh to myself. You had told me your last name Weber 
means weaver. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just said you bought yourself a loom and mm -hmm. self taught yourself <laughs> how to um, weave. To be fair, yes, I did. Although now that I think of it, I had said I had not done a lot of fiber art in the past. When I was a very young child, I was very obsessed with ancient Greece for a while. And so I had built a loom when I was a kid uh, because I know in Greece they wouldn't use a loom, but it was just like a little hand loom, like an old frame or something that I put nails in with like an art teacher or something. Uh, but yeah, I, I am pretty much self-taught on... I've had like one, and I did it like uh, maybe a year or two ago at this point. I did one uh, embroidery class with the same um, Altair that uh, hosted the competition you mentioned earlier. So I did take one course with them after the fact, um, but for the most part, uh, yeah, you can learn a lot on the internet and... <laughs> So I'd either like trial and error um, or like trying to Google things. But um, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I I remember just being like really obsessed with it for a while and I was just weaving on that loom. It's like a smallish loom, weaving on it like nonstop for like about a year. Yeah, well, so that kind of leads into what I was going to bring to everybody else was you've all kind of mentioned that meditative, magical quality uh to when you're in the zone doing your work um Chantel what did it feel like for you is it similar different well my process involves a lot of labor and a lot of uh, manipulation nothing happens if I don't make it happen so it's agitation it's super simple principle of wool water and agitation I'm the one that creates the agitation so I'm rolling and rolling and rolling uh, my piece until it starts binding together so while I, I'm doing this this rolling you're supposed to count but you kind of just lose yourself and I get the best ideas mm -hmm. when I'm disconnected like that so whenever there's I'm trying to problem solve something and I'm just rolling and it's hundreds and sometimes thousands of, of rolls that you have to do I have to stop and go write it down just to make sure that uh, so I really encourage people sometimes to they they hate this part when I give workshops they go oh, this is this is but that's that's a, the time where you get to go in and actually just reflect or not. And you just you just lose yourself in, in the motion because it's a rolling motion and it's very calming. And like I say, it's a slow process. You can't hurry it up. You can do it a little faster, but it takes the time that it needs to take. And that's an exercise in patience, which I don't have a lot of, but <laughs> I'm building it. <laughs> So it, it's one of those things that um, it's really going back instead of doing. And when I started felting, I, I wanted to produce, 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 produce. And I wanted to go fast, fast, fast. And the wool won't let me half of the time. It'll it'll tell me that I'm, I'm doing it wrong or it's just. So it's one of those things that you just kind of have to listen to what you're doing and, and let it be what it wants to be. Hence, let, let, leave, let go of control to a certain extent. Amazing. Rosemary, I think you used the word meditation. Maybe I did. not. <laughs> yeah. um, so when I started stitching, the first thing I was doing was sashiko embroidery, which is basically straight stitches um, that come together in these beautiful geometric patterns. And I'd been having a conversation one day with a friend and we were talking about portals because that's what you do. Um, and talking about a portal as this thing that that lets you go inwards and lets you go deeper, you know, just sort of thinking, you know, thinking through your life or thinking through images. And so I, I went home and I was thinking about that. And I said, well, how would I do that? Like, how would I make a portal? And I started doing these things, which are actual layers and layers of fabric. It's like this one has at least 12 layers of fabric. And I stitch circles. And then after I've stitched the circle, I cut it open and I see the next bit of fabric and I stitch a circle and then I cut it open, stitch a circle and cut it open. And so I have the repetitive motion of the stitching, which is really calm and meditative. And then I've got, I open it up 
And I'm always sort of surprised by what I'm seeing, but able to go further with it. And it, I guess for me, this is a, it's that practice of trying to get into whatever, whatever this center is, but it is those calm, repetitive stitches that, that helped me get there. And I realized like my friend had been trying to get me to meditate and it's like, I don't sit still very often. Um, and even when I do sit still, my leg is probably jumping, but at least when I was doing this, it was something that really made me, it makes me slow down. And sometimes like you, Chantel, you know, the notion of counting things, sometimes I'm counting stitches, but you know, whatever it is, it just slows me right down. So you guys are playing along really, really well because that totally leads into <laughs> to something else I was thinking about, um, which was, uh, Put, put Rosemary back on with me and then I'm going to go back to Candace and Chantel. Um, so talking about the portals, how much of that evolve, how much of that do you plan or did you plan and how much just evolves organically as, as you're working? Mm. With the portals, because I'm doing these layers, I have to select, I'm selecting all my fabrics in advance and you know, I'm layering them. And with one like this, that's so big, I have to decide, you know, some of the pieces are smaller and some are bigger. Um, but there's always an element of surprise as you're cutting them open. Um, because I usually have some pieces that are plain fabrics and then some pieces that are pattern fabrics. And there are times when, you know, I have a stripe in something that has a color and then there's a floral underneath it. And when I cut it open, somehow the two colors come together, which is just a total surprise. Um, but then I can also, when I'm cutting them open, I can also respond to them. So I see a color and then I can pick up on that color and sort of, and, and go from there. Ah, that's great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to Candace because you had your uh, hand up for a second. I know you wanted, I think, to hop in on the last question too. Oh, sorry. I was taking a little sip. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, some water. That's good because uh, I was still gonna. I was still gonna ask you the question <laughs> about uh, how your work evolves because I look at some of your three D pieces because you do a mm -hmm. lot of don't you three dimensional work. Yeah, um, yeah. I think um, so. I had mentioned that for like a year or so, maybe a little more than a year, I had been very obsessed with um, weaving and doing like embroidery hoops. Um, and at a certain point, uh, I, I related, I, I think it was something Chantel said where, uh, you mentioned, um, you just have like a million ideas in your head and you just can't go fast enough. I kind of, I kind of always sort of have things in the back of my head. And as I was working on those, it kind of, I kind of felt myself naturally wanting to like move towards more 3D things just like because I, I think I was kind of getting tired of um like those restrictions basically because I have a very small loom at the time and like you know you're you're um I usually would end up leaving work in hoops when I work on that as like a nice little framing so the way um I'll mention the the piece that I worked on for um hand and lock and I have like the mask for it here this is one of the the pieces where I started to do a little bit more like sculptural building. So basically uh, what I decided to do is I'd also done um, a Maker Labs has something called Tools for Change, which um, for anybody who identifies um, as a woman or um, on the spectrum of gender uh, can do, can apply to do, it's like a residency where they like teach you the tools and things like that. Um, so I learned laser cutting through that. And so I started doing like very small laser cut looms. So basically what this became was um, I had made all these different shapes of looms and like very small ones and I was making earrings out of them. So when I was coming up um, with the idea for, I think the um, sort of the framing they gave us to work with that year was, I was during COVID. So I think it was about duality, like physical and like digital. So um, I had the idea of, I have a background in like 3D animation. And um, I was like thinking about the concept of like a glitch. Mm -hmm. So um, something that would happen a lot when you're doing like 3D animation is you would have these like crazy glitches where 
all the they're like called polygons where like the shapes that make up like the sculpture would kind of like break and you would kind of see because like they're like when you make them lower and lower res they're like fewer and fewer points it's all little triangles so i took my little triangle loom i don't know how you can see but i would basically um it's a little loom that i would weave into and then i would uh embroider or bead on top of it and then i would stitch them together to kind of create like this low poly type effect and kind of like sort of the shape of like because i can remember like trying to do dynamics where you would break like like a human figure and it would be like sh actually i can share my screen and show a little bit of what i mean um so let's see so yeah so this is some of like the artists that i was kind of referencing when i was like thinking about this like this idea of like kind of just like jetting like uh, geometry um and yeah trying to balance um balance like this physical thing with uh this digital idea and kind of also referencing like the experience of like living through a pandemic um so yeah this is like some of my like reference materials for that and then um this would be um more of like the technical stuff of like how it was built. So this is like for the dress portion, but I also wanted to create a mask for it um, because as I'm sure everyone recalls, you didn't see a lot of like faces <laughs> during the pandemic that didn't have masks or weren't like through a screen. So it's kind of like this, yeah, this idea of like pixels and things like that. Um, but yeah, let me stop sharing. So, so a whole bunch of it was planned, <laughs> which yeah. is, which is great. I mean, you know, that's, I think we all plan our, our work to some extent mm -hmm. while you were in the process of doing the weaving. Was it more, more organic, less organic? Did you know uh, what kind of you were going to, this is kind of the rare project that I was a lot more planned on, um, at least in terms of the overall concept. Um, it was my first sort of, um, sort of like full look or like full like um sort of like a wearable garment type thing I'm also pretty new to sewing and things like that so it was like a lot to figure out and a lot of it was on the fly because I don't actually know how to do a lot of the things um but yeah I would say like as I was building it because I've never done something like that before a lot of it came from necessity of like okay this doesn't look exactly how I thought it was going to look um, or something like that. So you just sort of like pivot. Um, but yeah, I would say in general, I'm kind of more of a process oriented person. So like if something is not working the way I thought it was going to work, I will just pivot um, and it will kind of become something else. So the best of both worlds. <laughs> so Chantel, once you have uh, your material, your felt, how much of what you do with it after that is planned and how much kind of evolves organically? Do you, do you know what you're making when you start with it? I pretty much have a good idea because um, my fleeces and, and they come once a year, they're pretty valuable uh, unless I'm making stuff with waste wool, which is kind of more for a textural effect. But I usually have a project sheet that I really sketch really fast and it's mainly picking the right textures and colors. So I like to work with natural colors and add a pop of something that I dye, like this, the piece that I have behind me is all waste wool and the, the, the parts in the middle are beautiful locks that I um, dyed fuchsia. Uh, one of the sheep is called rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, call it <laughs> rosemary and pog. So there's two different locks that I like to use. Uh, I usually do have a plan, but I do leave myself some room for, you know, sometimes I, I get an idea as I'm doing it and I'm like, oh, this is, will be better. And next time, maybe I'll come back to my original idea. Uh, but when I usually do commissions or big pieces, I kind of have it all planned out. Um, and then it kind of just, it always surprises me too what it ends up looking like because I have an idea in my head, but on the other hand, I can't imagine how the wool is going to um, behave every time. And there's always a point in my project that I think I've messed everything up 
and it's just going to fall apart and this was a bad idea and I wasted a lot of things and then it turns the corner and starts binding together and it, especially the larger pieces uh, take a long time to get to that point and then it's a pleasant surprise then it kind of all comes together but there's always and even when I, I give workshops people go well it doesn't look anything like yours I'm like just wait mm -hmm. just keep working at it and I have to keep my reminding myself of the same thing that I'm like, I'm trying to like, why is this not working? Why is this not working? I'm like, ah, and then because sometimes I want it to be at a certain pace and it never is. Um, but it does surprise me every single time. Whatever turns around, it's often better than I expected um, most of the time. And it's, it's, it's just such a magical um, process. And speaking to Candace, I'm very much a process. It's all about the journey and how to get there. It's whatever I do in the end is almost bonus. <laughs> I know that's not a good thing to say as an artist, but my favorite part is often having both hands in raw wool, processing it and getting to know it. And it has a different personality, just like your hair is a little different from my hair, et cetera, et cetera. And from one year to the next, they change. Uh, even though you have your favorite, um, what happens to the sheet that year is often will reflect in its fleece quality. So during COVID, they had trouble finding feed and there was floods and this and that. And then the coats were, were just not pretty. They're like, you know, they're traumatized. So it's one of those things that you have to be in tune with what's going on. And and it's often the report card for the, for the shepherd of how they've done that year is the quality of their fleeces and, and how the uh, that renders into um, their coat. So every year, or twice a year, depending on the breed, you'll get a different result or a different um, uh, quality of, of these, these fibers. So my fibers, I can't just go to the store or the ones that I like to use anyway. I, I can't just go to the store and get more. So it's whatever I get, I get five pounds of it, six pounds of it, or even two. Um, that's all I got. So it's very valuable. But I love working with waste wool, which is whatever the shepherd doesn't want or doesn't go to the fleece. And then I create stuff out of literally little bits, things full of poop and I wash it mm. properly and it has a beautiful texture and there's no expectations when it comes to that. So it's really fun. That's where I get to play and, and just risk it all. And, and, and it's not valuable. It's not like expensive paint or anything. So I, I love to do things with nothing. And mm. that's the, the process of, of figuring that out, problem solving, pivoting, you name that sort of stuff. So talking about your pleasant surprise, one and all the pleasant surprises along the way and how you, you know, take the waste wool and do that. One question I've been asking uh, consistently in all of the talking art panels this year is about happy accidents. So it, it sounds like you take the happy accident and you pivot and something magical happens uh, with your work, but is there is there one happy accident or pleasant surprise you can recall that really turned a piece around for you? Well, it turned a lot of my practice around during COVID. I had um, Gotland waste wool, which Gotland has a beautiful, beautiful curl, kind of like your hair, has a beautiful lock and never ever would you comb it out you would keep it for the lock. So that's this texture that you see in the back. But I had the waste part of that and there was like all bits and pieces. So I carded it and I end up felting with it and it had a beautiful structure. So a lot of my pieces during COVID became structural like fins and things like that. So things that were actually exhibited and crawled during COVID. And I would have never allowed myself to do that in, in a normal time, like not using the waste or, or even thinking about putting it through the carter now. And now I, I sacrifice some of it because of its structural integrity and makes it a more, um, it's, it's better for three dimensional work or it's better for high textural work. Uh, and it has a beautiful, beautiful sheen. So again, this happy accident of having this, you know, thing that wasn't really worth anything it's just it was given to me and it's wasteful and but I can do something out of it it's waste no waste um and that's since then it's been my 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 practice now is more about what can I make with this particular breed that has this beautiful structural integrity so 
something else that's been coming up in, in the talks uh, over the past couple of days that I haven't been asking about, but it, it's a recurring theme, is, is COVID and being forced to use different materials and techniques. And it, it really sounds like um, that affected your work as well. Uh, uh, Candace, I know you were talking about COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, along with that, any happy accidents? You can answer one or both questions as, as you see fit. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's always, um, I'm trying to think of a good one, but yeah, there's always like, again, I am self-taught and I don't really know how to fully do a lot of the things I'm attempting to do. So there will often be things that I'm like, oh no, I made a bad decision. Um, and I guess one of those, one that I can think of off the top of my head, um, the piece that is in the out of control um, exhibition right now, um, the fabric I used for that, I don't think I like properly treated it for like, like fraying edges and stuff. So um, like it was a little bit, it probably wasn't like the best material to use. And like, if I was going to go back in time and do that over, I probably would have chosen something different. But I like that one is like meant to look like, um, like turkey tail mushrooms growing up like a tree, basically. And um, so I just had chosen it based off of, I think, more of the the texture and the print. But um, one of the things that started to happen was that uh, it like was kind of pulling and things like that. So I had to like kind of double up the stitches a bit more. And it, it ended up meaning that I had to do a lot more work on um, like beating the jacket and kind of making kind of like a third piece to because I had been putting on these like little mushrooms. Um, and so I ended up doing a lot of like sequence beading on the jacket, which I think gave it like a dimension it wouldn't have had if I had just slapped on those and then just had it like the plain fabric. So it's like stuff like that, where uh, I think in the end, it ended up looking um, cooler in a way. And like, maybe in the long run, it will affect how long that piece can like last <laughs> because the fabric isn't like the perfect fabric for it. But uh, I feel like those are like invaluable lessons to learn and then also to um, figure out ways to give it more dimensions. And um, like, yeah, I can't remember what the other question was that you had asked, but. I I think you're there and I, I okay. saw piece. So I just wanna let everybody know it's at the Charles Clark Gallery inside Strange Fellows Brewing. Brewery. Oh, I think that the one I was talking about, I think it's in the pendulum. Is that one in the pendulum? Because yeah, the, the, the mushroom one is in the pendulum. There's a there's another one in I think that one. There's definitely mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> As strange fellows. So well, I'm gonna go I back. Think one, I think that's a different <laughs> artist. Oh yeah, really? it might be a different yeah, artist. That's AP AP. Um I can't remember yes. her name. Ah. Heather. Heather Talbot, I think, is yeah. the mushroom. She's a needle felter and does three dimensional yeah. mushrooms. Cool. Not the same mushrooms. Not the same mushrooms. No. Oh, I'll have to check this out. I haven't been I haven't been able to pop by. Oh, there it is. <laughs> oh uh, uh, yes. yes. Like pendulum. Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you can see a lot of like the sequence along like the arms, like that was all added to kind of cover up that I don't know how to like put that all together. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think it ended up like giving it like a little bit more interest. Um, but yes, that one is at the pendulum. It, it now has like uh, a skirt with it as well. Um, but I will check out, I'm interested. I love mushroom related things. So I will check out that other piece. <laughs> Rosemary, I missed you a couple times, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, how much is planned? How much evolves? I'm, 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 I know where I left off. Well, I think we, well, I actually would love to talk about those, that idea of those happy accidents. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to put up um, one of my slides, the photos that I'm working on right now, because I have, I have these different ways of working. I have the, the pieces that are purely textile. Um, and then I have the pieces that are, that are stitched photography. And so here's one 
right now that this is one of the ones from Arthur Erickson's garden that I'm working on. And the thing that happens for me when I take these photos is I don't know, I never know what I'm going to get when I'm shaking my, my camera around. And I don't know, I'm always surprised by the colors that I get. And so here I was taking a picture of the water feature in the garden. And the greens are always the thing that, that attract my eye to begin with. But then you can see I've got this large burnt out area starting in that upper right that then begins to fracture and become those little sort of sparkles um, of the water and sunlight. And so I was trying to figure out like, what do I do now? Cause I mean, how am I going to embroider those? The, the embroidery threads that I use are these beautiful lustrous silks from, uh, from France. And I thought, well, I could do a color but that's not going to work. And so I ended up down at Dresso um, with and got um, metallic thread. So I think you can flip through to one of the other slides. So we are getting, a, that's the sense of it. Those are these big ones. Um, yeah. Um, and then, yeah. So ended up that dress. So picking out metallic thread, which I never thought I would be using. But for these, actually the two in this series, it's, it's really important that I have them because um, that's what that's what the piece needed. So I think I've spent so far probably eight hours um, stitching metallic thread on these on these photographs, and I have these three pieces in process, and hopefully they'll be up in frame by uh, next week. <laughs> you have one week. I I do. <laughs> yeah. One week in about eight hours <laughs> or so. <laughs> and then, and I know you, uh, 2021 is when you started. It is. So, so it, sounds like it was honestly the whole pandemic thing. It was, I, that whole time had been really difficult. I started with uh, an emergency surgery at the end of two, nine, 2019. Um, my mom died in 2020. My mother-in-law died at the end of 2020. We did a lot of caregiving in between. And so the beginning of the pandemic was just about as bleak as it, as it could be. Um, and then 2021 came and it's just sort of like, okay, yes, I'm going to start doing things that give me joy. I'm going to start doing things for myself, which is when I really got more into this meditative practice of stitching and started developing more of a practice around that, something that I did regularly. And so here I am doing all these calming things and then doing some different workshops online because there were so many different things available. But one day I sat down to do my meditative stitching and I was not meditative. I was just, I was just all riled up. And I went upstairs to my sewing basket and I grabbed this mass of stuff from the bottom of it. And there were pipe cleaners and there was yarn and there was all sorts of thread and everything was all tangled together and so I took that tangle of stuff and started stitching it onto a piece of fabric because I was going to tame it or I was going to tame this feeling or do whatever it was with it and then that became the center part of this triptych that I've done that starts from a black bubbly part to this sort of turmoil in the middle um, finishes with this sort of calmer piece up on top. And um, I entered that in a um, exhibition for the Surface Design Association. And uh, that piece was published in 2021. So that was the other thing that really sort of got me launched as, um, as a fiber artist who was beginning to see that these different things that I was doing coming from different inspiration, coming from whether it was frantic but happy taking photographs or frantic and just full of angst doing that stitching or else the calm part of the contemplative and repetitive movement that somehow all of those it's like Chantel when you talked about finding your medium it's like I had tried painting I had tried collage I had you know I tried making I tried sculpture I had I tried drawing like I've never found the thing that let me express myself or that seemed to be my unique voice and somehow in the midst of all this, the photography, the stitching, the stuff, somehow that's, that's where I found my way of expressing myself. 
it, it sounds like there's a lot of magic happening between uh, agitation and meditation. Uh, Absolutely. Between the three of you. Um, so you all make very, very different work. All gorgeous. Uh, a little bit different, I think, than what uh, maybe the lay person thinks fiber art might be. Uh, is there a bit of, I don't think renaissance is the right word. Is, is fiber art having a moment? Is something, you know, bubbling up under the surface, do you think, that's, that's pushing it forward and, and um, creating this, this tension and this new work and, and, and bringing it to light for us all? It, is fiber art having a moment? Or is it finally having <laughs> that's a That's a better way of putting it. I feel like, at least from my perspective, um, it's maybe a twofold thing is number one, I think through the internet, these are more accessible skills to like learn. Mm -hmm. And I think more people like become aware of them. Uh, but I also think it's um, in more recent times, I, this is always like work people have done but I know that like historically, primarily it's been like women doing it, which automatically makes it like a less valuable art otherwise, like compared to things that are associated with men. So I think it's just like being labeled more now as an art. Maybe people are seeing it more that way and sort of embracing it as a medium as like, I'm sure people have always have, but I think it's just getting more attention now because we're thinking about it more in that way. So yeah, that would be, I guess, my take on that. Yeah. <laughs> so as a, as a decorative, as opposed to utilitarian. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Doesn't mean it can't be both. Yeah. No, no. Right. Yeah, I, I think I do a lot of decorative for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Chantel, what do you think? Is, is it finally time for the moment for fiber art? I think there's been moments. It comes and it ebbs and flows. and of course, the fact that there's social media and you can see other people doing things um, really creates a momentum and a snowball effect. Uh, and that's a lot of the way that I got into felting is because I saw people that I aspired to be, like people that do, you know, library walls, not mm. just like a little piece. So what talked to me was the, how do I challenge myself and how do I figure out how to make these big, large pieces because of course I like doing the small things and they're always going to be my studies and my I need to get my hands going and doing smaller pieces but I really really get excited about trying to figure out the logistics behind doing large scale installation mm -hmm. which is the, the thing that you thought I already did but it's, <laughs> it's in the process so I'm going to be doing that next year so my exactly. piece is going to be 300 square feet and wow. 12 panels for a window installation in Maple Ridge so yes, um, thank you, Jody. Um, so it's not done yet. And I had to teach myself, Candice, some <laughs> digital work to make this happen. <laughs> this is not my forte. Uh, to basically, I, I made a prototype, a small prototype about 40 inches, um, this one. And they loved it verbatim. And they said, nope, don't change a thing. And I just need to scale it up now. So that's um, the part that I'm really looking forward to is every, I've got seven different fleeces. Uh, they're all going to get a little dye bath. Um, they're all going to get processed. They're all going to get combed and eventually felted into these panels. And uh, I was just there today, which is really funny to go get my prototype because it needs to be first painted on a very large scale, 25% bigger than what it is to create my patterns. Wow. So before uh, to do my layout, so I don't just kind of wing it, um, you know, you kind of divide everything in 12 and but it needs to be bigger so I need to start bigger so it can shrink into the size that it needs to finish so most panels are about two by six feet and the larger panels at the bottom are six by eight and that's a scale that I can do by myself but the painting of it I can't do by myself so somebody some painters are going to do this for me which is really great and I can't wait to see the process behind that so the fact that I can also hire people to help me do these large scale projects is something that's super exciting to me. And at the Arts Factory, we have that support within in-house. We have a scene shop 
and and people willing to uh, to to support us, the artist at a at a reasonable fee. Well, that's Let's just say we get friends and family rates is what we get. <laughs> it's lovely to be able to have these things that that I can um, you know work on these large scale installations because trying to do this by myself in my little studio that wouldn't it would it just wouldn't be possible. And how many pounds? How many pounds of wool is that going to take? I need 25 to 30 pounds, but I got 37 just to be sure. <laughs> and I couldn't make a choice. They were too cute. There's too many of them. Like, like I couldn't choose between my children. Um, so yes, so that's it, processing about a pound and some a day. And I lose about 20% when I clean it. So it's, I start out with more to, to finish with, with, uh, with uh, about 17 to 20 pounds in the end of uh but it's going to be big so it's actually quite lightweight even though it's uh yeah 20 pounds is nothing in wool it's only so, going to be uh heavy when it's wet and when i'm making it and then i have to roll it that's a whole different process altogether anybody wants some exercise come and see me between <laughs> march and may <laughs> um, but we finally figured out where your digital experience is happening because we already had it with candace and rosemary yours is just coming along the mm -hmm. end to make your larger project happen. Yeah. Uh, we have about eight minutes left. Uh, I don't know if anybody in the audience has any questions or if, if you all have questions for each other. Uh, if yeah. anyone attending has any questions, you can type them in the Q&A or there is a raise hand. And if you do that, I can turn your audio on so you can ask a question directly. It's not really a question, but Chantel, when you were talking about um, uh, the coats or like the wool that you get and how it's different uh, each time, I had never thought about that before. That was just very interesting. <laughs> I feel like I'm learning a lot. Absolutely. Well, because the industry has made it all the same. So the, yeah. the, the coats that I buy are usually probably not well looked at for the industry. So they're, they're mm. really good for artisans and people that okay. spin their own, uh, the characteristics are better because what the industry wants is just white and a lot of it and all the same and all the same quality. Mm -hmm. So they can just make big batches of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's actually going to be, a, I have posters and stuff for wool campaigns. So if you come visit my studio, I'll oh, yeah. give you a whole <laughs> bunch of paperwork on why wool rocks um, and the <laughs> properties of wool. So as much as I, I, I like working with it, I, I really do believe in, in going back to natural fibers like cotton wool and silk and things like that that you know yeah do not pollute interested. the environment and and you can reuse like it's you can reuse the wool into other stuff it's it's not uh it's not a bad thing like i use my waist i've got bags and bags of stuff and it becomes texture and there's a company that actually um, shreds old wool garments they put it all in the same right. type of thing and create make more fabric out of it oh. so it's 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 a full circle. It's not it's not a you know goes onto a pile and and landfill thing. That's amazing. Uh, I have a question from somebody here. Uh, Sherry, or a couple questions. Sherry is wondering uh, if you all feel that fiber arts are more respected as an art form now than in the past. Similar tie into I think Kate's question. I, th I think people have a real appreciation for things made by hand. I think that's coming more to the forefront. And whether that's the pandemic when lots of people were at home doing hobbies themselves or taking something up and trying something new, or um, whether it's just, you know, almost the flip side to doing a lot of things online or digitally that you want to do something that you can actually touch and feel. So I think maybe handcrafts in general are something that that people are there, there seems to me that more of an appreciation. Uh, yeah, to piggyback off of that, I actually meant to say it earlier when they asked the question of how you got into this. Um, but yes, it was exactly that. Because um, I'm a digital artist or like I went to school for like a digital uh, medium. Uh, one of the things that drew me to doing this was just like missing doing things by hand or doing like, like a physical thing. Um, so yes, I think that definitely plays into it for sure. People are looking to uh, connect with materials and where things come from. There's a, there's definitely a going back to simpler things and appreciating 
uh, the work that goes into things. So it's it's still it's still a struggle to to get you know when you tell people how much it costs and how long it took, they're kind of like ooh. But I mean, it's like any art form. Uh, you make it look easy, but it's never easy. So. Um, I see another not there question. Yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we, we have another question up here for Candice. Uh, mentioning the grant you used to learn laser cutting. What was the name of that again? Uh, it, was, it's, it has changed names since I've done it, but it's called Tools for Change Now. Um, and it's run through Maker Labs, which is also a part of the crawl. Um, so if you go in uh, and like walking around, you can ask uh, for information on that, or I'm sure it's on the site, but I believe it's, um, it's been a couple of years since I've done it now, but I believe it's not necessarily a grant. Like, I think there's still like uh, some financial cost to it, but it's essentially like, I think a little bit, um, less expensive than just signing up for a membership. And you also get to learn um, all the courses that they uh, offer for that. Uh, so that you will learn laser cutting. And I think they have like a CNC machine and there's like a wood lab and different things like that. So uh, in the end you do like end up saving money on like learning each one. Cause once you learn how to, you're trained on the equipment, they allow you to like rent time. So that's like what I do now for like laser cutting is like just rent out the time and then I can use their laser cutter. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend, yeah. So we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, so I wanted to use it to take the time to thank the three of you for coming out tonight. I know you're really busy getting ready for crawl next week. And I also wanted to remind uh, everybody listening out there where they could find you uh, in your studios. So Candace Weber, you are loudly insecure at Gore Studios in Chinatown. Yes, the the noodle sign above us. There's a couple of different Gore Studios, but that's that's mine. <laughs> and then Chantel, AKA Felt Alame, you are at the Arts Factory. Uh, what's your address again? The Arts Factory is 281 Industrial, which is on the corner of Station. So if you're looking at the map, we're either the first studio on the map or the last one. So you can start with us, grab a program and start going east. And Rosemary Bird, you are so centrally located at Parker Street Studios. What floor? <laughs> I'm on the fourth floor. So, you know, you can get your exercise by walking all the way up. If stairs are an impediment, we are running an elevator during the crawl. So you can get up and down. But my, my suggestion is start at the fourth floor and then you just get to drift all the way down. <laughs> and start on Thursday night because... Mm -hmm that's the best time to go out because you're going to beat some of those crowds and you won't have to wait in line for the elevator at Park Street. <laughs> Sunday morning is a great time to chat. Good point. Okay, so thank you everybody. This is going to be online, I believe tomorrow and you will find it at the link on the Talking Art Culture Crawl page. I'm excited to see everyone next week. Fabulous. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Jody. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>